Hi, I'm your host, Becky Davis, and you're watching GardenWise, Santa Barbara's most informative show about sustainable landscaping. Santa Barbara County currently remains in its seventh year of drought, which is why water conservation is more important than ever. With landscapes being one of the highest water users, there are many ways people can learn to save. In our first segment, Rachel White of the Goleta Water District shows us some of the best ways to maintain a healthy, water-wise garden. Hi, I'm Rachel Wright, and I'm here with Goleta Water District. Today, I'm gonna to give you some tips on how to maintain your landscape and ultimately help you conserve water. Let's get started. One of the most important and easiest ways to help maintain the health of your garden is to make sure that you maintain a healthy layer of mulch. It should be between three to six inches thick, and I'm gonna add on a little bit more here. Make sure you keep it a few inches from the base of your plants. Having a healthy mulch layer will help keep moisture in, reduce your weeds, and ultimately add nutrients to the soil. If it looks like your garden needs more nutrients, you can always add some compost as well. Another important area of maintenance is weed removal. With the rainy season, you may see an increase in growth of weeds and other unwanted plants. Make sure that you remove them as soon as possible before they go to seed because they're competing with your landscape for nutrients. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you remove the entire weed, root and all, because they can grow back from the root. Another thing you're gonna to wanna to look out for is the presence of pests or rotting and decay on your plants. First, you can start by wiping down the plant and just removing the insects or maybe even using some water. If that doesn't work, switch to using an organic pest solution. And as a final resort, you can even use pesticides or insecticides. Make sure you do your research before applying these because if they run off of your property, they can lead into local creeks or even into the ocean. Most importantly, make sure to manage your irrigation well. Leaks or poorly placed irrigation can be a massive waste of water. So make sure that you check your drip irrigation and sprinklers at least once a season. With sprinklers, they can be at the wrong angle or be bumped and moved, and then they will be spraying onto either paved surfaces or areas that don't need that additional irrigation. Make sure that you check the angle of the sprinkler heads to be sure that they're hitting the intended landscape. To check drip irrigation, you're gonna to wanna to uncover it from under the mulch. Here, we're gonna be checking the drip line under a tree that is watering the root system. You're gonna uncover it and inspect the line for any breaks or emitters that have popped off. If you see a lot of emitters popping off of your drip irrigation, you might have an issue with pressure, especially if that line was converted from sprinklers. Make sure to check that the pressure is correct and you might even need to install a pressure reducer. You may see breaks in lines because of pets or animals, especially pets love to chew on these lines. After you've completed your inspection, be sure to cover up your line again with mulch. To be able to manage your irrigation well, you need to be familiar with your irrigation controller. Don't be afraid of them. With some time and patience, you'll be able to operate it easily. An easy way to know how much to water is to go to waterwisesb.org forward slash calculator and plug in the information regarding your landscape. First, you're gonna select your location and I'm gonna select Goleta 93117. And then you're going to have to name the area of your landscape you would like. One of the suggestions is front yard, so let's use that one. Then you're gonna tell them what type of plants you're watering. You have multiple different options, different grass options and medium water use to even low water use and a native option. Let's go with the native trees and shrubs. You're also gonna select your soil type. Most areas are gonna be a clay loam in Goleta. And then for your watering type, you select if you have sprinklers or rotating nozzles or even drip irrigation. So let's go with drip. And then you just add that area to your schedule and it'll give you an estimated watering schedule throughout the year, January through December. An easy way to adjust for the seasonal and weather changes throughout the year would be to plug in the suggested water time for your July and August months and then use your watering percent adjust feature on your controller to adjust throughout the year. You can visit waterwisesb.org to find the watering percent adjust weekly that you can adjust your controller to. 
For an even easier way to manage your irrigation, consider installing a smart irrigation controller that will automatically adjust for weather conditions. Check with your local water provider to see if there's any rebates available. You can also visit waterwisesb.org rebates to find out what's being offered in your area. If you've noticed pests wreaking havoc on your plants, consider some alternatives before jumping straight to the more toxic methods. In our next segment, Oscar Carmona, instructor of the county's Green Gardener program, shows us all about IPM, or Integrated Pest Management, and how the best way to prevent pests is to simply keep your plants healthy. Hello, I'm Oscar Carmona, owner of Healing Grounds Nursery. I also teach the Green Gardener program with Adult Ed, and uh, we're here to talk today about IPM, which means Integrated Pest Management, and it's a holistic approach to dealing with pests and disease problems. We're here today at Alice Keck Park Park to see plants that are wonderfully uh, growing uh, in their natural state, uh, meaning very little pruning and with lots of flowers, which is a key element of, of IPM. So let's take a little tour around and see some of the, uh, the plants that are blooming and we'll talk a little bit about why that's important. So Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, has five fields of control. Number one, uh, education. Number two, cultural, which is our management uh, issues. Third is uh, our physical controls, uh, exclusions or um, traps, things like that. The fourth field is biological controls using beneficial insects. And the fifth field of control uh, are pesticides, be they organic or chemical. Here at Alice Keck Park, we're going to touch on a couple of these uh, topics and uh, illustrate why they are important. The first field for IPM, or Integrated Pest Management, is education. It's important to note that the premise of IPM is that a healthy plant will be less susceptible to uh, disease and pest problems. And in order to know uh, whether a plant is, is getting what it needs, there are really wonderful resources that we have at our disposal to, um, to enlighten us if, we, if we're not familiar with different plants to uh, be able to provide them what they need to grow well. Um, one is the WaterWise SB website, which is uh, a wonderful resource, not only for uh, plant materials and learning uh, about what they uh, require to grow well, but also information about irrigation and classes. So it's a great resource. The other is uh, the Sunset Western Garden book, which has a lot of key information about plants that are pertinent to where we live here in Southern California. And uh, the third are um, these little things called pot tags, which come with the plants. And if you're able to maintain or save those, uh, you can find out or remember a lot of information about the plants that you have to know if they're getting what they need to, to grow well. The second field of action is cultural controls, and that basically uh, has to do with management. Now we take the information from the, uh, the first field of, of action and we apply it to the cultural controls, meaning that if our soil is lacking of organic matter, then we want to add compost and mulch. Or if our watering uh, is off, if we're watering too much or we're watering not enough, then we need to make that adjustment. If the plants are getting too much sun where they really need more shade, we need to consider maybe moving that plant so that it can get what it needs. Um, so these are actions that a gardener or a homeowner can take to make the plant healthier, putting it in an environment and giving it the things that it needs to grow well. Again, the premise is that a healthy plant is more disease resistant and these are long-term solutions. It doesn't necessarily deal with the short-term problem, but in the long term, these will effectively do away with the disease and pest problems that we may be seeing uh, either on a regular basis or infrequently. So let's go over to Island Seed and Feed and to visit my good friends there and talk about the other uh, fields of action. So here we are at Island Seed and Feed. Uh, it's a great place to come for anything and all things uh, organic and sustainable in the way of landscaping. And uh, we're gonna go in and talk to Matt Buckmaster and find out a little bit more about uh, physical controls and barriers, uh, beneficial insects, uh, and then uh, pesticides, organic pesticides. So let's go on in and find out. Matt, what, what can people uh, expect to find here uh, at Island Seed and Feed? 
Well, Island Seed and Feed has uh, long specialized in uh, natural uh, garden and farm deterrents to pests and such in the garden uh, out of not wanting to use non-organic pesticides and such. So we only carry uh, organic, all natural pesticides, which of course still kill bugs and of course are still um, pesticides. They still need to be used wisely. We have a lot of products that exclude bugs. We also have uh, beneficials that would eat the bugs in your garden if you say released a bag of ladybugs in your garden in the evening. And if they hang out just a couple few days like in your garden, they're gonna lay eggs and you'll have uh, ladybug larvae all summer long eating uh, mostly aphids, few other bugs too, eggs of other creatures that you don't want in your garden. We have sprays, we have barrier products like copper tape which people put around the top of raised bed gardens and uh, snails and slugs supposedly will never cross it. It does work to a degree, so that's one more thing you can do. Uh, in the realm of gophers, which a lot of people are dealing with right now because gophers are having babies, and so people are watching their gardens disappear, just like in cartoons. And uh, in the past, people have used traps. There's all kinds of traps. We have them. I don't need to show a grizzly trap here. They're easy to set and they work. But there's also uh, a little less violent method of dealing with your gophers, and that would be a gopher barrier. And in the past, there have been these gopher baskets that are made out of metal that, of course, break down into not-so-good things in your dirt, and they aren't uh, organic uh, certified. And recently, in the last few years, this is products come along. This is a gopher basket that's made out of stainless steel, and it's actually approved for use in organic gardening. You don't have to worry about uh, about things getting picked up uh, by your plants that are in this gopher cage. And it keeps the gophers out from getting to the roots of your plant. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the kinds of pesticides that you, the organic pesticides okay. that you have. Well, I, I took three different products off the shelves. We have some others. Um, I don't have particular brand loyalty to anybody in particular. Um, so I often get a lot of different products that customers come in and rave about. We try them, decide they work or don't work. Most of them work famously. This one here is organicide, which its uh, main ingredient is sesame oil. It has fish oil in there as well. It works as a fungicide, so it fights fungus that are, say, attacking roses. It'll kill a lot of soft-bodied insects, white flies, uh, aphids, fungus gnats, that kind of thing. So there's that. This is a mite and insect control. A lot of the same creatures are targeted with these. This one's uh, rosemary and clove oil. And I have another one here that's peppermint oil. And uh, we have still others that are based on soap. Um, there's some that are made from horticultural oil, which is like a paraffin, which people can spray on fruit trees to fight uh, everything from the glassy wing sharpshooter to um, uh, any one of a number of things that'll be suffocated by oil being on their bodies. Thanks a lot, Matt. <laughs> hey, thank you. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for coming in. Yeah. So uh, Island Seed and Feed is a wonderful place where you can get all sorts of uh, sustainable landscaping supplies. And as we talked about in IPM, the five fields of action, the third field would be barriers and exclusions. So that would be these products here. Uh, the fourth field is uh, beneficial insects. As I said earlier, uh, when plants flower, they will naturally attract, but sometimes you need a little bit of reinforcements. Uh, so you can order them, mail order, in this case, uh, ladybugs, but other insects too that do wonderful uh, work in your garden. And then lastly is the, the pesticide family and, and, and organic pesticides are pesticides, just the same, um, they're classified as such. Um, and the point of all of this is that you see hopefully that the use of chemical pesticides is really the last step. And there are so many uh, things you can do before you even get to that point. So try to remember every little detail of IPM. Just know that it's a progression from the most benign act to ultimately, if you need to get there, in many cases you won't, if you follow these steps, the toxic uh, pesticides, in which case you're going to need to be really careful how you use those and make sure you follow directions. Anyway, Oscar Carmona, uh, wishing you happy gardening and um, We'll see you next time. To learn more about the Green Gardener program or to register for the class, visit greengardener.org. We'll be right back with more GardenWise.
water wisely. It's simple. Visit waterwisesb.org. Let's save together. It's 4 a.m. Do you know what your sprinklers are doing? Broken drip emitter. Gurgling spray head. Broken pipe. Runoff. Check your sprinklers for leaks and repair. Visit waterwisesp.org for more information. Welcome back. You may remember in our last episode, local landscape architect and author Billy Goodnick visited the home of two of his clients to help them design their backyard. Up next, Billy returns one last time to help them with their final step, selecting the right plants for each space. We're back. Yes. So, Billy, uh, the hubby and I discussed everything we talked about last time, and we both decided that we want to do basically everything you so suggested. The so fire pit area the here. Fire pit. Yes. Mm -hmm. at the, uh, the citrus trees, uh -huh. um, the raised vegetable bed mm -hmm. with a possible trellis for some, you know, vine type veggies right. or berries, um, the water barrel right under our raised gutter. Yeah, it worked out perfectly, the location. Yeah, you don't see it from the house. Um, and then making that hot tub area more intimate, more romantic. So now right. we've been on waterwisesb.org looking at plants. Great website. And we sent a list and there it is. There it is. So why don't we look at some of the different sites around here, figure out how we narrow this list down to something manageable without it just looking like chaos and okay. get the right plant in the right place. Perfect. Okay. Let's go. So yeah. this is, this is going to be the, the fire pit area, right? Yes. And you said something, maybe just six people or so sitting around, six or eight, so we don't need all of this paving. No. So one thing I would do here, this is very crowded in this section. I think, uh, although the plants are growing just fine here, I think it could feel a little more lush, a little more filled in if we take some of this paving out and relax this bed. Um, I love this plant. This is Japanese Aurelia. And although on some plant lists, it's going to say it's a higher water using plant, some of it just has to do with location because this is north side, very cool, the ground is cool, this is doing beautifully, and I'm guessing you, you don't have to water it that much. No. So this is really nice, but one of the things I see just looking around this area is almost every plant is the same shade of green. Mm -hmm. And flower color is great, but it's sometimes there just for a few weeks or a few months. So let's not rely on just having plants that flower. Sir? Question, um, talk to us about budget. Is it? Are you talking about removing everything we have here and putting something different in? In my mind, I sort of triage what's doing okay, what can you keep, and what are, what's the worst case scenario, what do you have to take so out? So that's keepable. So example. I like this, and it, it's, a, it's a cool plant because it's got this really coarse kind of bold texture. It's a dramatic plant. And underneath it are some nice plants, a little pruning of these lower leaves are going to expose this um, lily turf underneath. Uh, so what if, as we remove some of the concrete here, we just double down on what's already doing well? Some of these plants could actually be dug up, separated, and just spread around. So you're really just talking about how long it takes to pop something out with a shovel and move it around. So that's a really nice plant. And also over here, this uh, clivia um, or kaffir lily is another great plant that's doing fabulously. So I wouldn't think uh, twice about letting it be and just working with what's here, doubling down on it. So this bed is in really good shape, a little bit of pruning and a little just clarifying. Things are kind of in each other's business, but that's just a light pruning, moving things around. So give you a big check mark here. I don't see us needing to add anything in here. So this side's doing great. Let's talk about what's doing over here. So not the end of the world here. This, this is a uh, pittosporum or um, uh, mock orange. And it's a dwarf form and it's doing okay here and it's probably not all that time consuming to prune it. Um, but it's in this sort of boxy form and it looks to me from the other pictures you've shown me, you're looking for kind of a more natural type of garden. So uh, one thing we could do when this gets a little bit smaller, when the paving gets smaller, is just let this relax and instead of you know, pruning squares like that, just let it be a little bit more natural form. Or this could go away, get replaced with something that 
naturally grows in this amount of space and still leave a little in front for some kind of contrast, some flower color, that type of thing. This is sort of the elephant in the room. This is bougainvillea and beautiful plant and has lovely flowers, but when you confine it to a really small place, same sort of thing. It's always being cut back and they rarely flower because they flower on the new tip growth. So if you're always getting it out of the way of another plant, it may not be the best choice in here. So uh, that one of the strategies is just to let it grow a little bit more naturally. So this is a pretty important spot. This is the backdrop for whatever focal point we do out here. We're gonna see it from the fire pit. We're gonna see it from the dining area. Mm -hmm. And as Fred is now allowing us to shrink this area a little bit, get rid of the lawn, we've got a great opportunity back here to um, screen the fence a little bit, make the house go away next door and create a really nice backdrop for whatever happens out here. And I was looking at the plants you have on your list. There's a great plant called purple hop seed. May I impress you with my multi-syllabic botanical please. talk? Dodonea viscosa purpurea. And the purpurea tells us it's got purplish leaves. It's a wonderful uh, dense plant that'll get anywhere from six, 12 feet high if you let it. We've got plenty of room for it to grow. Um, loves this sort of dry, hot location and becomes a nice color foil for whatever else we do in front. The trick here though is that it's a plant that naturally grows six feet across. So what I'm designing with that plant, I would put them like every six feet. The good news in terms of budget is if a plant gets big, we may only need two or three of them to fill this area. So we start with young plants, we let them grow up taller. Um, probably would uh, get rid of the white vine here. Uh, behind it, the potato vine, because they're going to take up some room and, and get swallowed up. But another plant that I'm real concerned with is right over here. Would you please step into my uh, <laughs> office here? Yes. This uh, lovely in the wintertime hibiscus, it's got a nice Hawaiian sort of feel to it, but there's still a problem in our area. They were ravaged by a uh, white fly. Uh, for years and they're still susceptible to it and they're very thirsty plants so if you're really serious about wanting to cut down on on water use here this would be a good plant to just eliminate it's okay. going to cost a little bit more put a few more plants in here but we're starting to work our way toward the veggie garden um, I think I mentioned another time there are shrubby plants that are also edible pineapple guava was one on your list a little okay. bit of pruning would be beautiful soft gray kind of foliage Moving on? Moving on. Moving on. So I guess the last thing, things we want to talk about are the raised uh, vegetable bed. Right. And I'm thinking some fresh herbs. Italian. Great. I'm half Italian. Uh -huh. mm. That would be great. <laughs> um, I was also thinking about, pardon me, dear, the screening for the hot tub right there. Right, I created a little... done a couple of things, but I'm not sure which would be better and which would be faster growing. I might have the perfect plant here based on your list. It looked like both of you like rosemary, nicer culinary herb, uh, but also it's a dense shrubby plant that'll give you screening and it's pretty controllable by height. It's not a uh, California native, which would be nice um, wherever we can do that, but it's really adapted to our climate. It's a great Mediterranean plant. You can find more about it at waterwisesb.org. Look, look up all of these plants, get down to, uh, to the nitty gritty with them. So I think that would be a good choice in here. We also talked about screening off the side. Uh, could be the pineapple guava that's gonna give us some height, just run it along the edge. So I think we're getting close uh, on all this stuff. So um, before you hit the nurseries, and I highly recommend you hit some of our local nurseries here, okay. um, the locally owned ones, because the people are very experienced with, with all the plants here. So a few things you want to think about. We've thrown a lot out there, but uh, start by figuring out what the plants need to do. Okay, by that I mean screening uh, for the neighbor's views. If you need to cast shade, it's a tree, that sort of thing. So it's the role of the plant. Then what size plant is going to do that? If you want to screen the view from the neighbors, we're going to need something tall. So you're asking questions about how tall does this plant get? And the other thing you want to know is how much space is it going to take up? Because we don't want to go back to squeezing plants up against the fence and that sort of thing. So two is how big is the plant going to get? Three is, is the tougher one, and this is why you need people with some nursery experience. Is it going to grow here? Does it like the amount of sun, the amount of soil, how much you're willing to water? User-friendly. User-friendly. And the fourth thing is then just making it gorgeous. So looking at images online, 
going back to waterwisesb.org and looking at those galleries of, of um, gardens so you can say, oh, you know, find something you agree with, a little more tropical looking, etc. And then you're ready to pick out plants. So buy wisely. You can start with small plants, wait for them to grow. Don't have to break the budget. If you need anything else, give me a call. Go back to the website. Help is a click away. All right. And uh, let's get started. See you again. Thanks again. For a great list of WaterWise plants, check out the plants database at waterwisesb.org. Are you looking for the perfect tree for your garden? If so, you're in luck. Up next, we visit Jeff Nyman at Santa Barbara Natives Nursery to check out his favorite tree and learn why it could be the perfect fit for your Southern California garden. Hi, my name is Jeff Nyman from Santa Barbara Natives Nursery, and today we're here to talk about Toyon, or Heteromelis arbutifolia. What tree is that? What tree is that? Ah, what tree is that? What tree is that? We're here today on beautiful La Ploma Ranch in Venedito Canyon on the Gaviota Coast. And this plant is one of my favorite plants for screening. And it's also totally drought tolerant. We actually planted these about three and a half years ago because the owners of this ranch wanted to screen this garbage dumpster area. So we planted these and some other native plants in here and they're doing beautifully. It's one of my favorite plants because it'll grow almost anywhere. You find it a lot in riparian areas, long creeks, but also you find it covering whole hillsides like you'll see in just a minute. The most impressive thing about it is it's the only plant I've found thriving underneath eucalyptus trees. If you look behind me on that hillside, there's hundreds of Toyon up there, and that's why Hollywood got its name. You can imagine the Hollywood sign right there. It's red berries on spiny looking green leaves, and at Christmas time, you've got something that looks like holly. This is a, a beautiful example of how lovely the berries are, and, and they provide really amazing food for a lot of wildlife. And the way we grow this is we actually take these berries just like this, and we put them in a blender with some rainwater and make it look kind of like um, bird droppings. And then we just take that and sprinkle it into the pots and cover it up and grow it. So about two months ago, I took the berries and blended them and put them in the pots and covered them. And here are some little babies coming. So these are just about six weeks from germination. These are from Mission Canyon, Heteromeles arbutifolia. And here is a one-year-old. So this was looked like this last December, January. And this was the size that we planted down at the dumpsters to screen that dumpster enclosure. And so those are about three and a half, three years old. Toyon would basically need no maintenance at all. Um, if you do want to keep it shorter, you can hedge it, but it looks better if you just leave it its natural shape and it will grow into a medium-sized tree. It does not like moisture. So in the nursery you have to be really careful and we don't water it in the summer because it doesn't like it and it'll get molds and mildews. So you wouldn't want to have it in a place where it's getting sprayed by water. If you buy one to plant you would only need to water it for the a few times in the first year. After that, you should never water it again. It, it, this is a totally drought tolerant plant. It blooms in the late spring, summer, and then the fruit is on it for Christmas and the fruit will stay on it up through January, February. You can see some of these, the fruit's already gone, whereas this one, just genetic variation, this one has a lot of fruit still. If you decide to have Toyon in your yard, You'll be very happy with the bird life that it brings into your garden and the bees to come and pollinate the flowers. And it's just a very hardy, beautiful plant. If you think Toyon is the right fit for your landscape, you can pick one up at your local nursery. 
Well, that does it for this episode. Remember, you are the agent of change, and together we can create beautiful, climate-appropriate gardens. There are lots of resources online to help. Visit waterwisesb.org for tips or to view past episodes. If you have any questions or comments about the show, you can give us a call at 564-5311. I'm your host, Becky Davis, and keep it waterwise, Santa Barbara.